A very good evening. The music of Giuseppe Verdi setting the scene tonight. I'm Mary Nicholson from ABC Classic, your favourite radio station, and it's my really great pleasure to be with you tonight for another event in the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra's Ears Wide Open series. And a big thanks while I'm at it to presenting partner Tarawara Estate. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land we're gathered on this evening here at the Awaki Auditorium, the Boonwurrung people of the Kulin Nations, and present our respects to their elders, past, present, and future. Welcome, too, to our captive audience here to my left in the Awaki. Later on, I'll be asking you for your questions, your comments. We'll have roving mics. And also, viewers on YouTube tonight, uh, please post your questions and comments, too, while you're enjoying the show. So ahead of us tonight, we have, uh, well, a marvellous evening. How can I put it? We're going to explore, I suppose, through words as well as music, uh, this week's Melbourne Symphony Orchestra concert, well, one of them, celebrating the birth and death of William Shakespeare, the Bard, this month. A concert coming up this week in Hamer Hall and also Costa Hall in Geelong. So behind me, you can probably see, I'll be introducing them in a moment, three very distinguished guests, an actor, a composer, and a maestro. I'm keeping it mysterious. The program is a terrific one, I think. We have two 19th century Shakespeare obsessives topping and tailing a major new work. The composers are Hector Berlioz, the French composer, and Giuseppe Verdi, the brilliant composer of opera. In between, as I say, the Melbourne Symphony pro premiere of a work by Australian composer, Melody Ertfersch, who's sitting behind me, a work called Ruler of the Hive. And it's a fascinating piece, um, something you might not come across very often in the concert hall, that marries five of Shakespeare's very feisty female characters and some of their forthright words with music. Now, before I introduce the panel, I'm delighted that our award-winning actor tonight, Pamela Rabe, who's going to deliver the immortal words of the bard in this work, is going to set the scene for us by presenting a little of the monologue uh, given by Amelia, Desdemono Desdemona's maid and Iago's wife in Shakespeare's Othello. So without further ado, please make Pamela Rabe welcome. But I do think it is the husband's faults if wives do fall. Say that they slack their duties and pour our treasures into foreign laps, or else break out in peevish jealousies, throwing restraint upon us. Or say they strike us, or scant our former having in despite. Why, we have goals, and though we have some grace, Yet have we some revenge? Let husbands know their wives have scents like them. They see and smell and have their palates both for sweet and sour, as husbands have. What is it that they do when they change us for others? Is it sport? I think it is. And doth affection breed it? I think it doth. Is it frailty that thus errs? It is so too. And have not we affections, desires for sport and frailty as men have? Then let them use us well, else let them know the ills we do. Their ills instruct us so. What a great way to start, isn't it? Um, maybe we could come to you first, Pamela. Um, Amelia, she seems to be, uh, well, a very modern character in a sense. She's um, a bit messy, but she, she really stands up for women in the sense that she, um, well, against all odds, really, with violence all around her, and she is violently killed in the end by her husband. She stands up to these men at this time, doesn't she? Yes, as often many of the female characters in Shakespeare do, and some pay a price for it. And if it's a comedy, 
they get married. <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, we'll be talking a little bit more about these five extraordinary women as the evening continues. But I'd like very much now to introduce the composer of this major, very ambitious work, actually. I think it's 25 minutes all up, isn't it? Half an hour. Half an hour, yeah. right. Yes. Uh, ruler of the Hive, Melody Ertvirsch, please make her welcome. and conducting the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra. Always a huge pleasure to have Johannes Fritsch with us this week, who is not only conducting this concert, but another one later in the evening of completely different repertoire. You're amazing. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> so, Melody, I think we should start with you about your new work. Uh, originally, we should set the scene and tell our audience that it was a uh, commission from the Tasmanian Symphony Orchestra, and Johannes has since uh, performed it in Brisbane too. But originally, you got a call, I think, in America, did you? Yes. Um, where you were living at the time mm -hmm. from TSO Management. What were they asking you or offering you the opportunity to do? Uh, well, really, it began as a, a follow-up to a piece I wrote for them in 2016, The Sakara Bird which Johannes has also conducted, <laughs> thank you. Um, and uh, it was quite a, a massive brief. Um, I mean, being asked to write a 30 minute piece for a symphony orchestra immediately is like, wow, okay, this is a serious deal. Um, but I wholly embraced it um, because it is, TSO is one of my favorite orchestras. They're, pr they're pretty phenomenal. Um, and I readily jumped at the opportunity. Um, the, the only thing I wasn't prepared for was uh, the addition of having a narrator <laughs> involved. Okay, as I so that was part of the brief, was it? Absolutely. Uh, and yes. it, the idea was to focus on Shakespeare? Um, or was I that? Think, yeah, it, th that became a part of the idea because of um, it was a uh, centennial celebration okay. back in 2018. I can't remember what. Shakespearean celebration it was. I couldn't quite figure it out, but <laughs> they were programming a lot of Shakespeare-inspired music in mm. 2018. Um, so they wanted to commission a new work that also uh, drew from Shakespeare. So, I mean, everybody here in the audience and watching, I'm sure, um, will have had their own first initiation with Shakespeare uh, as a youngster. What was yours? <laughs> Do you really want to know? <laughs> Unfortunately, I spent most of English in the music block, um, <laughs> practicing for my band music, trying to get out of classes. Um, so my first like, real impactive um, Shakespeare experience would have been that terrible movie Romeo plus Juliet, because I can't say and Juliet for the for that movie. It's I know it's a abominable, <laughs> um, but yeah. So um, I had to later go and uh, experience the works for myself. Um, and actually, thinking of it, um, I went to a uh, sort of a camp for learning different types of uh, methods about music theory. I met a great composer there, Osnat. Um, who was actually supposed to have my job at the conservatorium. Um, but she introduced me to, she always carries a volume of Shakespeare with her. Um, so we had a few glasses of wine um, and were reading Shakespeare one night in one of the recreation rooms. Now that's just come back to me now. It's very interesting. But, yeah, so it's once you embarked on um, a pretty rare, as I was saying, pretty rare task of putting marrying music with Shakespeare text in this way with a narrator. Um, did you have a feeling that you were dealing with sacred text or did you feel from a 21st century point of view that you could just dive in there and do what you wanted to do? I could not dive in. There was definitely a gap that I had to try and bridge myself like in, in how I experienced the words and, and the works in general. I felt very distant from it at first, and Pamela helped me with that. <laughs> okay, well, let's bring Pamela yes. in here. So early on, you did you meet with Pamela before you'd written the work, or? Uh, in the, uh, I think I'd written a little bit at that mm -hmm. point, um, but it was mostly still focusing on what am I, you know, understanding the words, which when we met early in 2018 or 2017. 17, <laughs> I think, yeah. yeah. Um, meeting with you um, and just discussing and trying to understand what those excerpts were about. It really, really helped with that and gave me a few references. Um, to true. We just story. kind of talked around around the houses, actually, mm -hmm. just about the, you'd already at that point chosen a few. I had three. Speeches, three yep. that you um, 
had been gravitating towards. Mm -hmm. And then out of that conversation, and we just talked about everything from Betty Friedan to you know, <laughs> the Jan Cott and, and, just, and even just my personal experiences mm -hmm. from some of the roles that I'd played mm. on stage. And then you so came how did you finally decide? Attitude. How did you finally decide on the five? Um, what's um, the glue that brings them together? I think you made reference to a couple more that I'd missed. I like, couldn't oh, remember what, what wasn't in there that is there now. I can't remember. Mm. No, I can't remember. It's all either. just a big. But there are yeah, so many, <laughs> and I mean, yeah. the five that you've chosen are, are so delicious, but they create a kind of. Um, you know, by inference or something, a statement of melody, what melody is drawn to in the women. And there's, yeah. there's something about the, the nature of uh, women who are suppressed uh, or oppressed, who are fighting for agency um, for all sorts of different reasons, um, but are all incredibly smart. <laughs> And um, yeah. some of them are quite strategic, some of them are quite mischievous, some of them are quite desperate. But uh, they're all quite unique. And, yeah, they're, they all, all have they're all unique. And I think it's not surprising that, I mean, I, I have, you finish with Rosalind's epilogue at the end of As You Like It. And I've had the privilege and pleasure of playing um, Rosalind. And it's such a, I, I, it's such a wonderful role in a wonderful play. It's my favorite play of all time, I think. Uh, it is so full of love, but it also, I think, articulates what Shakespeare really felt, uh, which I felt coursing through other productions that I've been in or watched, which is that um, women are smarter than men. <laughs> and I mean, I, I think that's there. He sort of says that there are all sorts of things that within the kind of social context, the structure, the culture of the time that he's living in and the importance of balance and harmony and hierarchy uh, and harmony in the spheres requires a kind of a balance and a marriage and a peace, but that in the end, um, if you try to suppress women within that, they will bubble up out through the keyhole, <laughs> and, uh, and you, will have, you will have chaos, and that there's, there's some acknowledgement that needs to be made of the equality of the genders, and, uh, and, and down deep, I think he thought the women were actually smarter. <laughs> <laughs> so once you'd settled on the five women, that would have made your task a hell of a lot easier, I imagine, yes. Melody. And um, I should let the audience into, know into the, that I actually went to a bit of the rehearsal today. And I was really captivated by um, the music that you've written. It actually is very Shakespearean, if I can put it that way. I hope you'll take that as a compliment. Absolutely. Um, because it is full of character. It really does reflect the characters of these five women in very, very different ways. I mean, if, even if you didn't have the monologues you know, you could be drawn into these feisty characters uh, as presented by the orchestra. Yeah, so just briefly, and because we can't talk forever about the score, obviously, but uh, what was your process and what sort of ideas came out of reading these monologues? Um, well, it was uh, actually, I had Pamela record, um, like just with her voice, the monologues, um, and we, you sent them back to me. Mm. And it was from listening to actually, you know, a, a great actress speaking these monologues that I could then really get into the process of writing the music. So thank you for that. <laughs> um, but in terms of the Shakespearean sound, that's I'm, I'm glad that you said that because mm. um, it's a kind of a subconscious thing I like to do with my music, I guess, is to really create a sound world that reflects the topic of what the music is about. Um, and it's kind of tricky to do. It's, very, it's difficult to say exactly how you do it, but it involves um, kind of placing yourself mentally, you know, in that time, you know, I would have listened to music from that period. Um, and just by osmosis, kind of bring it back into my music again, not specifically write out, you know, counterpoint, <laughs> um, and then you put into my music. Uh, it wasn't that kind of a process. It's definitely a subconscious instinct. I, I hear it like this, but then I write it like this, and there will be a transferal of that sound, but into a, a modern setting. Had you written for a soloist with orchestra before? 
No. Oh, so this is your <laughs> first con concerto, as it were, because so it is yeah. that in a sense, isn't it? I mean, you could have a singer with the orchestra or an instrumentalist, but instead yes. you've got this um, beautiful mellow voice. Well, mm -hmm. not always mellow. <laughs> voice of Pamela. <laughs> There's definitely a, um, a respect that you have to give to the voice or, you know, if it's a solo instrument in terms mm. of the balance between the orchestra and the voice. And I, I honestly struggled with that because it's you've got this powerful, gigantic orchestral machine and then the voice. <laughs> and it's just taking care of that voice and making sure there's enough space around it. That was a huge challenge for me. And you know, there still are issues from that um, residual in the piece. But um, yeah, it was very challenging finding that balance. Johannes, if I could bring you in, you've conducted a lot of the, the great operas written by these composers of the 19th century, particularly um, set to the great Shakespearean texts. Uh, do you see similarities in, in this work, the, you know, the world of opera, voices and creating balance with the orchestra. You, you know, there are some Wagnerian voices that can soar over a full symphony orchestra, but, you know, composers have to be mindful um, that, yeah. you know, if it is a work for soloist and, and orchestra, you've got to allow that spotlight to fall on the, the artist. Yeah, well, well I think it's, it's fundamentally different to write for, for a singer with a trained operatic voice or to a narrator mm. who, who uh, uses very different kind of, of uh, colors and ways to express the, um, the text. Also, a singer is always written exactly in the rhythm to go with the orchestra, while the melody left quite a, quite a bit of space for, for Pamela to, um, to, yeah, to, to speak the text. And so there are, there are some points where we have to meet and space we, we have to find together. But it's not like a Verdi aria, where the singer is exactly uh, measured and has to follow exact um, notification. Mm. So, um, I mean, it's extraordinary, Pamela, to watch you up there in front of that full symphony orchestra. Your timing is exquisite. Um, you were telling me that you did play a, a, well, a French good. horn as a youngster. <laughs> yes. That was some time ago, though. Maybe we got good timing for the rehearsal. I hope I could hold on to that. <laughs> yeah, it's an extraordinary but, experience. But, yeah, have, have you stood in front of a symphony orchestra before like this? Uh, well, only Apart once before with Tasmania. the Tasmanian Symphony yeah. for the premiere of Melody's yeah. work. Um, I've had a couple of other, I mean, I've done a lot of uh, musical theatre, uh, but that's not in front of an orchestra or, as I've said, wrapped by an orchestra. Mm. I had um, the great uh, honour of um, being involved in a project um, for Earth Station in Adelaide with the Kronos Quartet. That was pretty special as well. But um, no, this is, this is special. This is what unique. What does it feel and the, like? The power of, well, you just, you feel everything. You feel the vibration. Um, the vibrations and, uh, uh, and the kind of the, literally the rumble underneath your feet as you're standing there and to have Del Bailo right beside you uh, taking you know an expression of grief from Beatrice in Much Ado About Nothing and it just moving from text into this cry on the um, solo violin and it's right there beside you is a and this is something experience. you do as your, for your daily bread, Johannes. Sorry? This is something you do for your daily yeah. bread, yeah. standing yeah. in front of a symphony orchestra. Yeah, but I guess it's a bit different because I have direct communication with the orchestra and I sort of, we make the music together. You have some in your back and you get sort of this sound wave yeah. right, yes. for, right from, from the back end and it's quite unexpected probably, but some, something <laughs> sometimes um, comes at you. Are there different it's, it's challenges fantastic. for you conducting a work like this with narrator? Yeah, it is. It is because, um, first, it's always challenging to, uh, to conduct a new piece mm. and to study a new piece and to, to make it al bring it alive again. And I think that's, that is a beauty about um, performing a new piece for a second and a third time. I always say a, a new piece is like a newborn baby, <laughs> but then it has to learn to walk and to speak, and that happens with a new piece through repeated performances. Um, and it might become part of the repertoire, part of the canon, or not, but without giving it a chance to do so, um, it won't. And therefore I find it so important that 
good new pieces get multiple performances. Well, this one obviously has legs. It's pretty unusual, actually, to have it premiered in 2018 and to have a further performance in Brisbane and now another mm -hmm. one in, in Melbourne. So you see hundreds and hundreds of scores coming across your desk. You've been, what, I don't know how many decades in, as a conductor now, but um, what sparks your interest when a score comes across your desk and you think, oh, this is, this is going to take off? Well, it, it depends. Yes, sometimes composers send uh, scores to you or, or orchestras and yeah, I've seen many in the last 40, 40 years now 40 years. that I'm, I'm conducting. Um, this particular piece I had in my mind, uh, I was not in Hobart when it was first performed, but I'm in close contact with the TSO and I heard about it and it was sort of at the back of my mind and when I found myself in the dilemma every conductor finds himself when F trying to find a piece to pair with Beethoven Ninth Symphony, hmm. which is only an hour and ten minutes or an hour and five minutes, and all my colleagues uh, struggle with what to put before or after. Nobody puts a piece after Beethoven Nine, <laughs> and then I thought, well, that might be exactly the right piece, and which I did, which I did in, in Brisbane. Yeah, we had a performance with Beethoven Ninth Symphony. And I thought this major piece from the Enlightenment period with text by Schiller, the icon of the German um, classical uh, poetry, to pair with a piece from today, a female conductor from Australia, uh, a composer, and Shakespeare, this absolute master of the words and, and the thoughts of the English-speaking mm -hmm. world. And it worked very well. Uh, it balanced well. Mm -hmm. So th that was the process, how yeah, it came to the second. Now, you mentioned Schiller there, and uh, I don't know if the audience know that you were born in East Germany, and you, you had these uh, towering figures of, of literature uh, around you, Schiller, Goethe. Shakespeare in Germany, how does, how does he sit in the pantheon there? Oh, very high, very important. In German, of course, yeah. in, in uh, yeah. quite good translations, I have to say. And I, I remember I saw as, as a student um, Midsommar Night's Dream and Richard III and As You Like It and Twelfth Night. But the real, real fascination with, Beth, uh, with, with Shakespeare happened when, when I was in Sydney in 1999 and saw um, Henry V with the Bell Shakespeare Company in mm. an unbelievable gripping performance. And uh, my English was really bad back then. That was when I came the first time to Australia, conducting Opera Australia in, uh, with the Wozzeck production. But the fascination about the language, and especially in that piece, where uh, in that play, where French-speaking uh, characters are involved with English one, and two of them fell in love, and they don't really understand each other because they're from different languages. That's, so, yeah. <laughs> No, well, it's interesting, isn't it, that um, that he is so prominent in German uh, cultural life. It is, yeah. Um, and are people as adventurous in terms of how they present his plays these days as they are obviously in the English-speaking world, looking for new ways of interpreting Shakespeare? Yes. <laughs> I, I took my family to, to play in Hamburg, the Thalia Theater with, um, I think it was Richard III, and my daughters who were eight and 12 and 13 back then. After two minutes, he looked at me and said, are we allowed to watch that? <laughs> <laughs> it was very adventurous. It was very out there. Yes. But it is interesting, like in the weekend, I went to a bookshop and uh, there were shelves of um, non-fiction and fiction about Shakespeare there. And I thought, this fellow's still got incredible currency, hasn't he? Um, and yet we hear all the time how difficult he is to teach to kids and all of that. It's, I mean, Pamela, what do you think? Um, Shakespeare rules still? Uh, I do when we can tap into, I mean, they are meant to be performed, mm. not, you know, read out loud in a classroom with a stick yeah. behind your head. And um, <laughs> Was that your and, first and experience? Always, yes. <laughs> well, not really, actually. We, I, never read, I never read it at school. We didn't... Because you, you grew up in Canada, didn't you? Yeah, so yeah. we were taken on, on a, probably my first experience would have been on screen as well, like Melody. In fact, Romeo, not plus Juliet, Romeo and Juliet, the Franco Zeffirelli, <laughs> yes. which dates us. That was, you know, that's funny that we both would have had a 
movie experience of it. Um, I think my first live was some probably being dragged as a, in a school tour to a production of Midsummer Night's Dream. And I do remember at that time, that was almost the first professional theatre production I'd ever seen, and being appalled at the behaviour of the kind of Jaffa-throwing students around me, because I was just trying to get the play. Um, but certainly once you start performing it, and every process I've found of, of, of trying to perform Shakespeare, you have to go through a process of decoding, and it's a bit like you're reaching through time to grab his hand. Yeah. And it's a, it's a process. And then when you get there, you just feel that grip go whoo. And if you can do it, and if you do it well, it reaches across time for an audience as well. And suddenly, you know, not only does time expand, it contracts instantly. And we see our lives in front of us. And we are excited by that experience in the present, but we're also moved by the experience of reaching out and touching someone through time, mm. who is a feeling and thinking of the same issues and um, you know dilemmas that we deal with now. Mm. And it happens, and mm. it's, I mean, it, thank God it does. It obviously yeah. still happens or it wouldn't still be performed. Exactly. Or would, adapted. <laughs> <laughs> would you mind presenting another of the, the monologues for us? Ooh, Could I'll you... try. This, you want a little... Um, Isabella? Isabella. From Maybe Persia just from say a few words about her as well. Can I just do it here? Yeah, yeah, just please be, be comfy. Say a few words. Um, um, just can put her into context. Isabella is a um, virtuous young woman whose brother has been um, arrested and uh, sentenced to death by a slightly pumped up local temporary authority <laughs> called Angelo and um, uh, Isabella goes to him to plead for clemency and for her brother's life. Oh, it is excellent to have a giant's strength, but it is tyrannous to use it like a giant. Could great men thunder as Jove himself does, Jove would never be quiet, for every pelting petty officer would use his heaven for thunder. Nothing but thunder. Merciful heaven, thou rather with thy sharp and sulfurous bolt spits the unwedgeable and gnarled oak than the soft myrtle. But man, proud man, dressed in a little brief authority, most ignorant of what he's most assured, his glassy essence. Like an angry ape plays such fantastic tricks before high heaven as makes the angels weep, who with our spleens would all themselves laugh mortal. Thank you so much. Can you um, put these women into a little bit of context for us, Pamela? Um, as I say, there's reams of, you know, pages and pages written about Shakespeare and women. What's your view of, um, you know, what his outlook was on women at this time when women weren't allowed to play women on the stage, were they? Well, if they do, did act, it was usually in some notorious sort of setting, wasn't it? Street theatre or whatever. Men played women in Shakespeare's yes. plays, didn't they? I mean, and there's some people who also theorise that the reason why, um, I don't know, uh, that some of the characters are so lovely is he had a particularly talented young male actor who could take on these roles. Yeah. Um, of course, I don't think that's necessarily all there is to it. Um, I, it's something of what I said before, but I do think that he feels that um, uh, women are very much equals, if not superiors, to men in their intellect and, and perhaps their circumstances have required them to be yeah. cleverer um, because they're always having to fight for agency. When you say you want me to put them into context, you're talking about each individual character? No, or? no, just as, a, as Shakespeare's women. There's yeah. Shakespeare's women. Well, that's a big one. <laughs> no, it's a as big one. As you said yourself, there are shelves and shelves <laughs> and shelves of literature. But your, the Pamela Ray view 
Because <laughs> um, he is, I mean, there isn't a play headed, you know, Emilia or um, Beatrice. Well, there is Ben. Well, there is. But, <laughs> there is, that's true. But, but he didn't do that. He didn't <laughs> she got do. into the, the title, but um, yeah. Sim, Jim Cymbeline. Um, <laughs> they sort I, of become, I mean, I think you, Melody, in a sense, in fact, I think you say something in your program note about uh, Ruler of the Hive that um, you feel that these women are major personalities in these plays, even though they're not given that kind of mm. status, as it were. Yeah, Are absolutely. you getting it? Yeah, I think so. And I mean, and I think he was a, you know, he was a feminist. So I think Betty Friedan would say that. I mean, there is, I wish I'd pulled it up to just remind myself of it, but I do know that there's this, you know, uh, uh, in As You Like It, Rosalind, under the guise of Ganymede, which she herself is disguised as a male, to, uh, to and then pretending to be a female in order to train Orlando um, uh, how to woo, at one point says something along the lines of, you know, close the doors upon a woman's wit to out at the window, close that to allow at the chimney, close that to allow at the key, that's the keyhole one. <laughs> and it's, um, and I think that's, that it, it's, it's so clever, but it feels so true is that he was basically saying, you just cannot keep a good, female down, you know, and uh, so I think there, and this certainly comes through in play after play after play, that, that um, you know, that, that these are, and I, and I do think in the comedies too, that the, the notion that, as you like, it ends in a marriage, that often, even all's well, and Helena's got a speech, which is a really terrible, sad story, but in the end, uh, the kind of clever machinations that the heroine and that goes through in order to get a guy that nobody would want. Um, but they are married in the end. And that I think there's always a statement saying that we need to find that balance, that acceptance and that equality mm. in order for the, the world to proceed well. Melody, you're the youngest person on the panel here tonight, and um, coming to the Bard's words, as it were, all these centuries on, I mean, um, the audience might think, oh, Melody Oertfersch, she's 21st century composer, woman, writing about Shakespeare's women. Maybe she's coming at this from a feminist point of view in the 21st century. Um, what would you say to that? Uh, it'd be accurate. <laughs> <laughs> um, but oh, it's, it's such a complicated, especially being a female composer, and I was, I was saying this to Sam earlier, um, you never hear people speak about male composers. It's always this term given to a female, because I mean, female, but um, yeah. So it's, it's already an embedded problem in that regard, in terms of my career and what I do. Um, so addressing the feminist issue, um, for me, connecting with this piece, I know I needed, I felt like it was the right time for me to speak to it. Um, I think it was, I mean, it was my early 30s. Um, so I'd been dealing with these kind of questions <laughs> for <laughs> 10 years or so. Um, and I guess it just kind of wore me down a little bit and it was the right time, it was the right situation. And yeah, I'd just become a, a mother for the first time. And it was all, it all just made sense to me. And I, I felt like I could actually connect with this, this kind of a topic for the first time. Um, and I mean, these women are all so like, secretly powerful. So I felt great working with the text and giving them a voice through the music as well. It just, it all clicked into place. I'm amazed to, to hear you say really that in this day and age that you feel I mean, the fact that you have to be called a female composer is one issue, I suppose, but um, it's such a common thing now. I mean, the gender imbalance has improved vastly. I mean, I was listening to Ross Edwards talking the other day, one of our um, elder statesmen of the composer world, I suppose you'd say, in this country. And um, when he went to Sydney University initially, they didn't have a composer course there. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> now you're lecturing here in Melbourne. Uh, so that has changed vastly, hasn't it? And Quite a bit, yeah. yeah. Our, the female composers in our department actually outnumber the male. 
which is, I don't think that happens anywhere else in the world. I think it's a pretty unique thing for the Melbourne mm. Conservatorium. Mm. So that is a huge step forward, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Um, yes. So with this work, with your um, linking back to Shakespeare, what are you trying to get us to think about um, with this work? Hmm. Uh, probably to appreciate the voice of, of the women and, and supporting it with music to give it a kind of a, a powerful character, like a uniqueness of their own for each of the different movements, um, which is a really... Uh, bold thing to do because <laughs> um, uh, we've been speaking about Shakespeare and it's you know it's a, a really strongly established you know uh, canon of works yeah. and taking that and you know trying to give it a different kind of voice well not a different kind of voice just perhaps amplifying the voice that's already there a different um, setting yeah um, it was ambitious I guess, and you know, like I said, it, it took me a while to really connect with the material, with the words, um, enough to get myself creatively to the point where I could write the music for it, which is, Pamela helps mm. hugely. I think it's really interesting. It's something like what Johannes was saying when you that question around how a concerto form uh, differs if you have a soprano or a mm. mezzo or. A, or a choir and you know dealing with a text but singing it against a actor speaking it and there's something that melody's reaching for which I find really fascinating and we're grappling with to find the balance that's right is that it's not when someone is sing, singing texts with an orchestral support you feel you get a kind of the spirit and soul and the emotional quality of something. But when you pull back and it's just a voice and text, it becomes about ideas, ideas counterpointed by spirit and emotion. And, and so it's really tricky making those two things weave together. It's exciting, trying, great. and you've done a great <laughs> job doing it, and and you've actually you've created these two voices, but they they themselves so is a metaphor in a way for mm. what the pieces are about. These two voices that are finding a way to speak to each other. Did you look at any of the canon that's already existing in terms of the operas I was mentioning, or the Berlioz, or? Uh, no, not Other really. Other Shakespeare settings, the you only... steered right away from them, did you? Not deliberately. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's very, the music that I listen to for pleasure um, versus the music I listen to for studying is quite different. <laughs> um, go on. We won't go into that. <laughs> but um, Mendelssohn um, is probably one of my preferred Shakespearean settings. Yeah. Settings. Mm. Um, Beyond that, no, it's when it comes to, I try to avoid any other inspiration centered music. Like, I, I want my own little creative bubble to do what I want and not be influenced. But, but with this piece, I think I read in your note, you said something about how much you love Renaissance music. And um, yes. yeah, there's elements of that in there, isn't there? That's the source, though. The source, yeah. okay. Not because it's almost like I remember, you know, writing papers, primary source, secondary source. You've got these layers of reference that you have to go through in order to find the truth or, you know, make your dissertation viable. Um, but I feel like the Renaissance would be, you know, listening to that kind of music is the primary source. And then the other Shakespearean inspired works would be the secondary sources, etc. It must that be fascinating sense. for you, Johannes, I was thinking, because um, as I was saying, you've conducted all these great works of the 19th century, or the operas and so forth, um, the, the canon of um, Shakespeare-inspired music. And then along comes Melody um, at this stage, you know, in the 21st century with this work, which really, um, you know, is the sort of next generation of, of great Shakespearean works, I guess you could say, isn't it? Yeah, but, but the, the, the concept is a bit different uh, if you compare it with Verdi or, or, or with of course, Berlioz. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned Mendelssohn, because what Mendelssohn did, his incidental music, exactly. um, he, except a very small chorus part and, and the, the um, couple of, of uh, uh, soprano voices, he, he doesn't write um, the words into music. So the words are Separate. the play, yeah. and, and the music comes between the play or there is, in, in some places, underlaying the play. Whereas when, when we look at, at the masterpieces by Verdi, like Otello or, or Falstaff, 
which is my favorite, by the way. Mm -hmm. The absolute incredible masterpiece yeah, uh, Verdi wrote as his, his last piece when he yeah. was 80 he, years old. Yeah. Um, he takes the story and he, he compresses it. He takes many, many details out. And one of his text, also his, his uh, poets, puts it in Italian words. And it's very seldom a word-by-word -word translation. Yeah, so it is, it is a Shakespeare play in spirit, but it's not the Shakespeare words. And, and of course, it's in Italian, and it has a different rhythm. The, the music has a different rhythm, and Verdi's world follows different rules in, in, yeah. in terms of creating the drama. And so it's a complete different take. And it's, it's, I think it's fascinating that, yeah. that we have those various ways to, to bring text and music together. Mm. And what about Berlioz? I want to play the audience just a little bit of uh, the Berlioz Beatrice and Benedict Overture that you're conducting this week. He's a whole different kettle of fish, isn't he? You know, he even marries, um, falls in love with this Irish Shakespearean actress, Harriet Smithson, and she is really one of the loves of his life. And I think Shakespeare, he was a Catholic growing up, but that went by the way, and uh, in the end, he called Shakespeare my father mm -hmm. uh, towards the end of his life. He really revered him, and he left us with some extraordinary scores, didn't he? Inspired by the Bard. Yeah, the opera, um, we, we play the Overture as Beatrice and Benedict, which is opera uh, based on Much Ado About Nothing. Um, beautiful piece, and where, where he actually focuses on the Beatrice and Benedict story within the play, which is actually the side story. Isn't it? Much ado about nothing. It's more he hero, and also it's it's more than just Beatrice and Benedict. Yes, it's more. Yeah. Um, but I mean, Berlioz was a crazy man. He was, <laughs> and then you hear it in the, in the music, <laughs> and the overture is bubbling from comedy and and virtuosity and and always uneven peri periods in, in the music. You have three bar periods and five bar. Very seldom a four bar, which is actually the rule of the time. So, and the way he instrumentates the piece, and so it's fantastic. I did it last year, and it was a great, great pleasure, the whole, whole opera. And so I was very pleased to bring the overture into this concert program to open it. Right. And then we have, at the end, of, as, as you mentioned, um, the ballet music Verdi wrote for the Paris production of, of Macbeth. Mm. Okay, let's um, hear a little of the Bellio, shall we? That's interesting anyway. <laughs> the no, thing actually, I can't sing it, it's too fast to sing. It's <laughs> the thing about the overture too, yeah, it is <laughs> it is really light and frothy for, yeah, yeah. for Berlioz, isn't it? It's um, almost like a, a the overture to an opera buffa. It is. Um, Rossini-ish, isn't it? Com comedy, absolutely. Comedy, yeah, yeah no. Yeah. And what about, um, I mean, could I ask you this question? What is it about Shakespeare um, and his writings that has so seduced so many composers over the centuries. What is it about Shakespeare more than any other com other great writer, really? I mean, obviously Schiller and Goethe, Goethe we get the great song cycles and so on, but uh, Shakespeare. Well, I think, oh God, I mean, for, for composers writing operas, they were always on research for, for great dramatic mm. uh, pieces. And you, you, f you find n never better pieces like Shakespeare. But yeah. many would choose, you know, their librettist down the road to write something for them based on whatever, whatever. Yeah, but um, they were not really successful, were they? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, that's interesting um, comment. It's sort of, don't you think it co coincides too with the kind of romantic and the kind of 19th century composers as well at the time when the kind of legendary status of Shakespeare was really starting to blossom? through the publishing of his works and performance. Yeah. I, mean, like I, I, I can't think of many Shakespeare operas that are based in the 18th century, the 17th? I'm just trying to think. Is there, is there, no, they're mostly all. Yeah, 19th century. Yeah. 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 And, and uh, Shakespeare speaks 
a lot about music in his plays. Yes. Yeah, so music is a big part of, of his, his world. And, and the music of the language itself lends itself yeah. very yeah. Yeah. much to yeah, it. Yeah, uh, maybe it's composers that were drawn to a particular style of theatricality, do you think? Yeah. But also with Verdi, you know, you've often got a great big canvas behind, um, but it's usually an intimate story, isn't it? Um, front and centre, think of Otello. Yeah. And this, you know, wars that have been raging behind him, but it is this, you know, group of characters who really the focus is on the whole time, isn't it? And that's for all his other plays yeah. that he set as well, I think. Um, yeah. You know, and what what about the Verdi ballet music that we're going to hear at the very end of our discussion tonight? Because <laughs> um, I gather that uh, poor Verdi rather reluctantly had to whenever he produced one of his operas in Paris. The French loved ballet from the time of Louis XIV, who loved to dance at court. So every poor opera composer had to provide ballet music um, for, the, for the public in France. And that's what happened with this, I think, didn't it? But Macbeth, which seems a really ludicrous thing to have a ballet in the middle of Macbeth. Oh, well, yeah, yeah. He, 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 he chooses the, the moment where ballet comes in place very well. It's in the, second, in the third act of the opera after the witches scene. So the witches are then joined by more ghosts and creatures of the night and all, all ob obscure <laughs> animals and, 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 and witches. And, yeah. then, and he writes quite, quite a exciting and dangerous music in a way. Yeah, it's great, and Affecting. the orchestra loves, loves playing it. <laughs> <laughs> Often nowadays in, in uh, opera productions of Macbeth, um, it's cut because we, we, we don't use ballet in, in the opera. Um, we go back to the first, first version of the Macbeth. Yeah, that's interesting though, because sometimes composers do, well, opera composers do write some marvelous entre acts and, yeah. um, you know, music that goes in between the acts when we're just sitting there in the dark, you know, digesting what's been happening and it can be very very effective can't it yeah oh, and this is a very effective bit of writing i think it is you know it's <laughs> terrific brass and energy yeah. in fact it's a great program to bookend your your piece mm -hmm. what does it feel like to have a piece you know that's the major piece in the program alongside these towering masters <laughs> yeah, it's it's new <laughs> it's important that they're complementary to you um yeah but i i trust uh, you know, Johannes, and if it happens in a different situation, I trust the conductor or whoever's doing the planning to have done, you know, their research. They know my music and they are familiar with programming procedures. You bring an interesting word into the discussion, actually, trust, because I was thinking what a tightrope you all w walk, in a sense, in this music business, you know. Obviously, Johannes knows the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra, but it might be an orchestra he hasn't worked be with before. Um, he might not have worked with Pamela. Pamela hasn't worked with this orchestra before. You might not have worked with Johannes. There's, there's a lot of risk involved in what you all do, isn't there? And um, being able to communicate what you want and um, get on with your colleagues, I mean, it's, um, it's a challenge, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, it takes a bit of getting used to. Yeah. <laughs> There's definitely better ways to uh, bring up questions and to how to talk to conductors and orchestras. There's, you, you learn that. But the results are worth it, obviously, aren't Absolutely. they? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. But I mean, particularly Pamela, too, for you, standing at the front of a symphony orchestra, something that you do rarely. I mean, obviously, in a, a theatre production, you know, you get, you've got time to get to know your colleagues and how they work and so forth. You sweep in here with a couple of days' rehearsal to deliver this in Hamer Hall and Costa Hall and Geelong. And you don't have time to build those relationships, really, do you? So there is a lot of trust on your part. No, but I think we're kind of used to those relationships, are we not? I think that's kind of what we... What um, you do. What we do. Mm. The hardest part, I find, is coming out of the 12 months of a pandemic and, <laughs> <laughs> and plunging into that instant... And seeing a live audience. You know, fast track to... Yeah. Exactly, to trust, but to also to communication. And just seeing faces, seeing faces without masks on, it's just an extraordinary thing, so... So for you, it's not a... No, it's exciting. It's, I mean, it's a, it's the, there are little nuances of culture differences. Not, like I forget to call Johannes Maestro, and I realise I must. I'm so sorry, Maestro. Oh. You know, but I mean, there's, there's, you know, that there are, there are, there are protocols yeah. um, that, are, that slightly are different, but then I would like to think that we all enjoy... Um, we have our 
palates both for sweet and sour. Yes. <laughs> but Melody, have you ever had a situation where a conductor has done a work of yours and you've not had a good relationship? Does that happen? And vice versa, have you had to work with artists <laughs> where there's been a bit of clash of personality? That's I a mean, wicked question. <laughs> it is. <laughs> um, and how do you how do you make you know you know the goal is to have a fantastic result musically or theatrically? How do you make sure you that is your common goal? Well, I think that's our common goal always. And mm. yeah. you mentioned risk. We always take risks a bit, but that's also exciting. Mm. Um, but when programming or when, when we plan to work with certain artists, composers, narrators, singers, then you, you develop a, a sort of a sense that it will be good, it will work. <laughs> and most of the time, it works, and then there are the odd moments where you think, ah, uh, it was not a good idea. It happens. Yeah. But, but that, that's part of, of our, work. that's all. part of our, our life performing um, yeah, profession, which is, which has lots of nerve-wracking nerve moments and it's lots of risks t has to be taken. Mm -hmm. uh, performing live in front of a big uh, audience and working with a big orchestra. And yeah, but it's lots of pleasure, I promise yeah, you. Yeah, so it's your lifeblood. And uh, last year, I know you were you know, able to conduct in Brisbane and Hobart, mm -hmm. um, but not presumably to travel overseas to Germany. Um, so how, how did you manage? Well, I love being home for six months. <laughs> Um, you love sailing, I know. Locked in the same house. <laughs> that was wonderful. No, but um, yeah, was said I couldn't go to, to Germany last year or this year. Um, but that's life. I mean, we can't complain. We we're in such a such a really privileged situation, and and not just in our day to day life here in, in Australia or in Tasmania where I live, but also also in the arts. We perform. We ha we have we have open halls now. Yeah, in various states with various regulations, but we will have an audience tomorrow and, and uh, on Saturday and on, on Friday, and next week hopefully too. And we had that for the last last month already, so no, nothing to complain. I'm super happy. And Pamela, I mean, you're a stage animal, obviously. Um, what was it like in lockdown? Um. I mean, it has been devastating, actually, for the arts um, around the globe. We are luckily coming out of it probably much more quickly than mm. most nations around the world. Uh, but I do know that, it, I mean, I was lucky. I was filming through Melbourne's hard lockdown and uh, I, I did a show for the Sydney Festival. I'm going into rehearsal for a play in Sydney at the moment. And um, But there are many of my colleagues who've not worked at all, in fact, have left the arts, left the industry in order to survive. And, uh, and many, it'll be interesting to see what happens over the next couple of years in terms of the long-term effects, both just on the econ economy and the soul and the culture of our nation, but also just on the individuals who are just dealing with this. So. Yeah, look, it certainly made all of us realize what's important in our lives, um, mm. you know watching music being performed online and so forth is one thing and it's been a fabulous development and of course we're streaming tonight which is fabulous to these conversations and music too but um there is nothing like being there is there the the um i don't know it's just it's one of those magical chemistry uh, chemical things that happens between human beings when music is being performed isn't it um and you must love coming out of your work space, um, leaving your little ones at home and mm -hmm. coming into the, the halls this week and seeing yeah. your music being performed. Um, yeah. What a thrilling time for you. Yeah, absolutely. I compare it to um, trying to compose on a digital piano versus composing on a real piano. It's like you can feel the vibrations coming through the keys when you're on the real piano. And it's kind of a similar thing in the concert hall, like just feeling the, the force of the sound. It's quite yeah. different. Yeah, no, it's very special for all of us in the audiences. I know everybody here will agree. Well, look, we've had some fantastic um, responses from people around the world. Viewers, hello. Um, joining us from Virginia in America, mm -hmm. Copenhagen, Sydney, 
Manchester, my old place. I used to live in Manchester, Vancouver, Liverpool in the UK, Canberra, Brisbane and Melbourne. Fabulous. Give them a round of applause. <laughs> How exciting. And I have a question from Jessica in Germany. Hello. Uh, for Pamela. What inspires you most about Shakespeare's music? What makes it special for you, the music in Shakespeare? The music in Shakespeare? Mm. I mean, I'm assuming that's about, um, I'm not sure whether it's Melody's music or whether it's <laughs> Shakespeare's music of his language or the music that's in Shakespeare, which I'm also very fond of, all the different adaptations from Dowland to, who, you know, all the uh, people who've done it. Um, one of my most favorite, um, it's probably not yours, Melody, but most of my favourite adaptations, <laughs> musical adaptations of Shakespeare is the, the final uh, uh, movement of Britain's Midsummer Night's Dream. You know, now is the hour, oh, now is the hour, yeah. which just sends yeah. me into, and in fact, I was listening to it on Sunday night because it was broadcast on, yeah. on ABC Classic FM. Um, uh, 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 I can't answer that one, Jessica. I can't. I don't know. It, it just, it's... Uh, <laughs> Uh, it just does something to me. Yeah, I mean, really, it, it's it's the sum of the two geniuses, isn't it? Mm. Um, whether it's Melody and Shakespeare, or it's you know Berlioz or Verdi and Shakespeare, you know, um, why would you want one without the other? Really, <laughs> this is a question from um, Gold Dust Woman, UK. Mm. How did you alter or match the tempo and musicality of the monologues? Uh, to match your music, or did it flow naturally? Mm. Um, yeah, that's that's an instinct mm. one, I think. Um, working with um, Pamela's recordings um, that that she made earlier on. So you had already and... created a music with your delivery of the lines. Well, Shakespeare had created the music. <laughs> I mean, it, it is. It's obviously yeah. iambic pentameter, yeah. or when he starts to yeah. break that. Another actor would do it differently. Yeah, they would. Mm. So yes, it's sort of a. It's it's through several handshakes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if we're allowed to have handshakes. And, <laughs> and now a question from Christine who says, from each of you, could you please name your favourite Shakespearean character, male or female, and why? Ooh. Johannes. Oh, please ask me last. I have to say <laughs> <laughs> I've already said mine, which is Rosalind okay. from As You Like It. But um, I also played Richard III and he, she was a lot of fun. <laughs> um, I'm going to have to go with one of the five women that <laughs> I worked with because I'm most familiar with them. And I would have to say Rosalind as well. Rosamond, why? Oh, I don't know. It just, I guess, gets under my skin. Um, the easiest out of, because I mean, I spent a lot of time with these texts. So it's the one that has the most residual impact, I'd say. Right. Well, I'm not going to answer because I don't have to. I love all Shakespeare. And this is from Sam. Um, having been a few years now since you wrote the piece Melody, <laughs> are there any other Shakespearean women you would include now? Would you add to the piece? Because this could be a growing thing for you, couldn't yes. it? I have often thought about that because I do like, I mean, I love writing small movements and the idea of like postcard, you know, snippets of, mm. of something. Um, but I would need to do more research. <laughs> Um, and have more conversations with Pamela, I think, um, before uh, attempting something like that. Fair enough. Yes. <laughs> now, wonderful audience here in the Iwaki. Thank you all again for coming out tonight on a very Shakespearean uh, evening, as far as the weather gods go. Uh, any questions from you? I saw some, somebody's hand go up there before. Don't be shy. Who would like to nominate their favourite Shakespearean character? All good, we've got a question here. Thank you. Hi, I guess it's a question for Pamela. I was wondering, you provided the recordings that inspired the initial work and how much of a feedback loop sort of happened once you started hearing some of the music come back in? How much did that inform your presentation of these performances? Um, quite a bit, yeah. actually. I mean, it was very symbiotic, particularly as um, there are some of the movements uh, where uh, Melody had actually uh, emptied out the orchestration to create a kind of uh, invitation for the text to, to come in. But there are others where you actually create a dialogue. Mm -hmm. So I'm actually responding to a lot of things that are happening in textures and colors around the different desks of the orchestra, whether it's a, 
a, um, a, a gliss off a harp that sort of comments on something that I've just said or, or, or a little entrada of triplets from the trumpets that sort of is a new idea and so that they become, it becomes a dialogue. Really good question. Wish I'd thought of that one. <laughs> Any more? No? I would like to say something, not ask, but uh, following up um, a comment you made earlier. I just want to, want to reflect on the amazing work the MSO mm. has to do in these weeks, um, because you might, might be aware that they actually do two concerts on Friday night, uh, on Thursday night and on, on Saturday. So the first one is the one we just spoke about with the Berlioz Overture melodies um, piece and, and the Verdi um, ballet music. Then they have one hour break, and then we do a complete different program with um, uh, John Towers' um, fanfare for The Uncommon Woman, an American composer. There's a piece written um, uh, 25 years ago. A new written trumpet concerto, which will be for the first time premiered on Thursday night by Holly Harrison, and then Dvorak's Symphony from the New World. So it's a bit American shaped program. So the orchestra has to rehearse and perform two completely different programs in, also within the couple of days we have in preparation and then perform those programs on, on the same night, which is uh, an incredible um, challenge. And I mean, they, they are fantastic how they, how they do that. And I can only encourage you to, to come to both concerts because mm -hmm. it, it shows two very, very different um, um, sort of sites of the repertoire of the orchestra, of, of the music, of the repertoire we, 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 we do. Well, we're the beneficiaries of um, this new setup with two different concerts being offered on one night. Um, but how about you with the workload? Yeah, it's, it's quite, quite big. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I have to That's say. a lot of music in one yeah. night. Yeah. Yeah. And as you say, um, a real changing of gear um, from the first concert to the second. Yeah, I think that's a real challenge because I'm used mm -hmm. to conduct for many hours in an opera. I mean, if, if you do a, um, a Parsifal, that's, that's five hours of music or a Meistersinger. But these are two concerts each, 70 minutes maybe, but with three different composers each. So that you have to really to be quick to, to, to switch from, from one piece to the next one. Mm. I've got one more question here from Beppe uh, from Melbourne um, on YouTube. Welcome. Um, just saying that, um, you know, sometimes when orchestras um, basically um, decide to present opera in concert um, or works that have a theatrical connection, um, does this divide the audience who have come for a purely orchestral concert or would otherwise, you know, if they love opera, would go to the opera or they love theatre, would go to the theatre? Anyone can answer this, but maybe I'll start with Johannes. So the question is if it divides the audience? Yeah, does it divide the audience, do you think? Well, I guess if, if you don't like opera and concert, you don't come to that concert. <laughs> <laughs> and if you love opera, but that particular opera is not performed in the pit in an in a, in a opera house, um, then you come to a semi-staged or a concert performance of an opera. So it's pretty simple. What do you think, Pamela, about the, the crossover? Well, I don't know. I mean, um, I would have thought if you look at it and it piques your interest, you come with an open mind. and you <laughs> Come with an open mind. Not, and that's right, you are getting something extra, aren't you? Yes. With this whole theatrical world coming into the, the, the concert hall. Yeah, I, I'm not quite sure about that. From um, Jess, I think this is, um, could this work ever be performed in another language or form like dance? Language, yes. Yes, I would have mm. Absolutely. Yeah, um, dance. I don't see why not. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I'm also it's... waiting for somebody to make a film. Yeah, it is. Like it could actually. Yep. There's there's, there's yeah. so much um, spirit and, and kind of color and expression within Melody's music and stuff. I think. I you mean, mean in a kind of Fantasia. Yeah. Well, sort of way, yeah, or, or anything. Yeah, yeah, a response <laughs> to it somehow cinematically. Mm. Yeah. Would you like Pamela to? Um, have a, an opportunity to present this work um, semi-staged? Danced. 
In I didn't know you had that talent yes. as well. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think it's... Is it um, not tempting I mean, to move? It's interesting, uh, the tension between, uh, in terms of how to express the ideas within each of these individual monologues that I do want to ask Melody about the title. But anyway, that's another thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, is that it, it's... Uh, the, <laughs> And I'm also curious, when you did it in Brisbane, you did it with some uh, students from the local, was it the yeah. con or the active students? students. Um, and there were, in, e there were different performers for each one of the speeches. Yeah. And that how much this can carry too much uh, performance, like, whether you're taking a wedge of a, of, a, of, a, of a piece of cake out of a production, mm. and whether that would start to compete with what Melody's done or not. I, that somebody else may have a different opinion about that, but I feel that this is sort of sitting in, Melody's actually created the color in the music, and my job is to try to uh, speak with the music and to communicate the ideas with not obfuscating with too much acting, if that's the right way of putting mm -hmm. it. Uh, but maybe it can withstand that, and that would be an interesting exercise for somebody to try. It would indeed. I'd love to see it. Um, a final question from Ekaterina to Pamela. Have uh, any of these characters impacted on you personally? Yes. Forever? Yes. Oh. They change your life. This. Sometimes it's just the experience of performing them. Mm. And, and, well, any experience in life is going to have an effect on you. But um, mm. yes, of course. In Hard to, without going into a long anecdote about something, but yeah, it, it absolutely has. I'll never forget, I'll give you one anecdote, <laughs> doing As You Like It in 1987 at the Melbourne Theatre Company in the Playhouse, which at that point was only three years old, and um, having a very rowdy school's matinee performance. They don't do them that often anymore, <laughs> but that was sort of 880 teenagers coming to see a Shakespeare. And I'm going, thinking right back to that first production, of The Dream, I did, but people got throwing the Jaffas in the field. And the, but them being so captivated by that play and that production. And at the point where here I am, a woman uh, playing a role that had originally been played by a boy, but I was a woman who then is dressed as a boy, who's then pretending to be a girl <laughs> to play with the boy to teach him how to woo the person who really is me, but I'm pretending not to be. And at the point where the exercise gets so hot and sexy <laughs> that they actually end up kissing and to hear 888 adolescents all go oh, 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 oh. Like it was, they were just so confronted and excited and shocked and I thought that's it, it works and, and you can't be in a space <laughs> and feel that vibration coming through you without it having an effect on you and it's just they, they, they all change you there's something so exciting about you know when they work when those risks pay off well i think this concert is really going to take off this week so i urge you all to come along to hamer hall this week or to costa hall in geelong um, i think abc classic is recording it too for future broadcasts which is exciting but um, i'm sure you'll join me in thanking our three marvelous guests tonight who are going to bring this music alive for us this week uh, melody ertvish congratulations i hope you have a wonderful week very, very I special work of yours. <laughs> Pamela Rabe, it's an honor to have you here with us tonight. Thank you. Just, to, just so, you thrill me with your, your voice <laughs> and your words. Um, and I know I speak for all the audience here. And Johannes, you bring us so many insights into the music. We've only scratched the surface tonight, but always a pleasure. Thank them, please. <laughs> I, think we're going to, I think we're going to go out with a little bit more Giuseppe Verdi. <laughs> Good night, everyone.